You're on mute, Alexandra. <laughs> uh, that was helpful. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of funny because everybody else can see that someone's on mute. Yeah. And, and Except for you. Because people time. can't. Well, I'm, it, I'm, I'm opening our Google Doc and I'm Great. just going back to pull it up. I just had it. Uh, are people watching us right now chat about this? Um, yes, they are. That's uh, the beauty of Zoom. We're all in this together. Um, so I'm posting in the chat. So we have generated our live YouTube link. And for our attendees and for our panelists, please feel free to spread this link around. Um, I'm going to go post it in the Facebook event right now as well so people can find Great. it on SciStarters pages. Wonderful. We're just going to give it a little minute for people to join and then we will um, introduce everyone. Mm -hmm. Caroline, are we still letting folks in on the Zoom chat? Yep, so um, anyone can chat. Great, thank you. So feel free to, um, for those attendees who are on the, the Zoom chat, chat, drop some questions in the Zoom chat. Um, tell us who you are, um, maybe something you're excited to ask um, during the Q&A section. We'd just love to hear from you in the chat. I see we got a message from John Anderson. Yes. Excellent. There's okay. several students who've been involved with Aurorasaurus and uh, that's awesome to see Great. you guys there. Valerie and Vincent and um, oh, good. Melissa Wonderful. from the Aurora Summit group. And Jeremy from Ontario. I think. Jeremy from Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> Ontario, that's great. Where in Ontario, Jeremy? I think it's RSC. Okay. Now we also have exciting, it is 9 a.m. in Australia ah. and we have a wonderful group of citizen scientists from all over Australia we hear that are joining in first thing in the morning. Thanks for rising and shining with us. Anyone, good day, mate, for real. That was terrible accent, um, but <laughs> good day, mates, to all our Australian friends and citizen scientists. Um, are we ready to do an intro of who is here on this incredible expert panel today and start meeting Steve? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone who is tuning in to this special Q&A hosted by SciStarter.org. Thank you so much to Caroline at SciStarter for putting this together and encouraging people to learn more about citizen science during April, which is citizen science month. We're very excited about this. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna ask Caroline to speak a little bit more about SciStarter and citizen science. But I wanna to introduce to you our incredible group of panelists. First of all, we have the Chasing Steve filmmakers. We have Leah Mallon and Jessica Fraser from BC, Canada, hello. We're really excited about this film. Some of you have already watched the film and some of you have yet to watch the film. All those details are on our website, chasingsteve.com. So don't worry if you haven't seen it yet because there'll be a lot of interesting things to soak up here and then you can watch it later or vice versa. You might have some great questions because you've seen it. So congrats to the filmmakers for an awesome feel good and really exciting story that is that is catching wave around the world. Um, I want to introduce Eric Donovan as well, the professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Calgary. Hello, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Hi, and, Alexandra. <laughs> uh, Chris Ratzlaff, one of the founders of Aurora Alberta Aurora Chasers group of citizen scientists. I, I've been on that group for a couple of years and was a big <laughs> fan and then found out about this film and um, now a bigger fan. Chris, thanks for joining us and we can't wait to hear from you later. And the, you. the incredible uh, Dr. Elizabeth McDonald, who's the founder of the citizen science project Aurorasaurus. Hi, Hi. Liz, and thanks for, thanks for joining us as well. We're really excited about this today. Um, what I want to do first is invite Caroline Nickerson. Are you here, Caroline, to give us a, a quick rundown about SciStarter and Citizen Science Month? Yeah, I'm so excited to. So um, Citizen Science Month is the month we're currently in. It's in April. And it's a global effort to get as many people as possible celebrating citizen science and doing real scientific research. 
Um, and when I heard about Chasing Steve and then when I watched the documentary, I was just blown away. And I'm so excited that we're able to have this event and um, watch Chasing Steve during this month and, of course, beyond this month as well. Um, Citizen Science Month is sponsored by SciStarter and a number of other partners, including the National Library of Medicine in the United States, um, Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society, uh, National Geographic, Science Friday, um, and a whole host of others who make this a reality and work so hard to spread the word about citizen science. Um, with Citizen Science Month, we had to pivot a little bit. Well, that's why you aren't really seeing this in person. All of our events now are digital. So even though we're still encouraging people to do citizen science, we want them to be safe. We want them to follow public health guidelines to practice social distancing, um, but we still want them to be just as connected and turning their curiosity into impact. So um, we just wanna thank you all for being here tonight. And um, if you go to citizensciencemonth.org, you'll find all sorts of different Citizen Science Month opportunities. And you'll also find the main Chasing Steve page from SciStarter where you can uh, stream the movie, um, find a link to Aurorasaurus and so much more. So uh, thank you again. Thanks very much, Caroline. And that's true. Everyone here on this panel today uh, has exciting things to speak about citizen science and ways that you can get involved and create impact in your own in your own community. And you know, we are all under this same great sky, and we do have a chance to look up and and participate together alone <laughs> from our couches. Uh, so I want to turn this over to um, Leah Mallon and Jess Fraser, our, our intrepid filmmakers. Please tell us about your film, Chasing Steve, and welcome to this event. Thank you for being here. Thank you, and thank you for everyone to, for participating today. We're really excited to be launching this film in a very unconventional way with how we normally launch films, but um, um, just to give you a bit of background around why, uh, why we made this film, Jess and I are filmmakers uh, from Vancouver and we were working with TELUS um, who's, who was um, looking for subjects for documentaries. And one is sort of a universal story and we were looking for a unique Canadian story and we came across the story of Steve. And we are not expert um, experts with uh, photography or night sky photography or Aurora. So, it really was an amazing opportunity for us to, to learn so much um, about Aurora and then about the amazing story of Steve. Um, but what we also recognize is as the story of Steve had already evolved when we first started looking at the story, um, other documentaries had been made, but we didn't feel like anyone captured enough uh, really around the citizen scientists who really were such a formative part of the story. So we were so excited to meet Chris Ratzlaff, who was one of our first um, persons that we reached out to. And he in, he in turn just really inspired us. We saw his enthusiasm for the night sky photography and the Aurora and, and also we tapped into this amazing community of citizen scientists. Um, so he helped us to really introduce, introduce us to, to a group um, one of the hardest things for us was to, you know, meet as many people as we could. We had a limited time to make the film. And so choosing, you know, who, who would be in the film and what photographs we wanted to, to portray in the film. Um, I would say that was one of the biggest challenges, but we really wanted to offer a wide range of um, different types of people that are inspired by um, photographing the Aurora and, and really are incredible artists that, that, um, bring so much to life. We chased the Aurora with a couple people what, during filming and, and yet the Aurora was elusive. So we <laughs> hope that the photographs that we get to portray in the film really um, bring, to, bring to life, you know, what, what the experience is for people to go out and to wait and to capture that Aurora in, that, in those moments where, where it comes out and, uh, and to see Steve. Um, so anyways, I'll let Jess talk a bit as well about well, I'll, I'll, I, I, I'm um, focused on keeping time, uh, but just a big shout out to the uh, Alberta Aurora Chasers who really opened up uh, their hearts and their homes and their families and their passions to us who were really um, incredible guides um, on this journey. And um, Liz and Eric, um, it, it's just been an incredible experience for us and it, it continues to inspire us and we continue to look deeply into citizen science as, as a movement. So uh, thank you everyone. 
Yeah, thank you. And a shout out to Laura with from Aurora Source, who I uh, I don't I think got introduced. So uh, <laughs> uh, she's been amazing also in helping us launch with Carolyn and Sci Starter. Yeah. So thanks. thanks. Hi, Laura. Um, thanks for being here. I want to. I want to move over to Aurora Soros now, and this is a great time for us to hear from Dr. Elizabeth McDonald and Laura um, to, to talk about the Aurora Soros project and citizen science, and also Steve. What is Steve? <laughs> for those who haven't watched Chasing <laughs> Steve yet. <laughs> All right, great. Um, I am going to share my screen and give people a link so they can uh, look at Aurorasaurus um, if they want to find out more information. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen and try and do this in five minutes. So I might not get to uh, all of what is Steve quite yet, but um, can you guys, okay, in a moment, can you see the slides of the Aurora in your, and Steve in, now? Yes. Yes. It's and shout out to NASA Space Science Education Consortium. Yes. Yes. So I wanted to acknowledge our sponsors at NASA and the National Science Foundation and also the New Mexico Consortium, a great group that has been hosting our website for over eight years. And uh, we really invite people to join us. We love collaborating with different groups around the world. That's how we met the amazing Alberta Aurora Chasers. And um, uh, yeah, we have um, um, some links to learn more. Uh, you can go to YouTube and um, we have a, a series of talks if you are if you want to learn more about the Aurora at home. Um, they start with, uh, they increase in complexity, so there's lots of content there. And uh, we really appreciate people's reports of Aurora. And you can get a free account and get alerts of where the Aurora are visible and uh, our newsletter and our blog and learn a little bit more about Aurora and um, Steve. Um, Aurora Source is mainly a map that takes different people's observations and also tweets. It's whole lots of talks I can give about that. Those are on YouTube. But um, basically, I did want to give a shout out to our developers for uh, recently um, making improvements to our website. So we're working on that. Um, after a number of years, things start to uh, not work quite as well. But the website is working quite well right now. And you can test um, and put in some observations, uh, like your past observations from this past winter or your upcoming observations from the Southern Hemisphere if you're so lucky as to see the Aurora down there. Um, but uh, check that out. And we're also working on updating the apps. That's the very quick message there. And we would love to have people join us, help get the word out, help collaborate, do more research about the rare types of Aurora and weird Aurora that are out there. Um, and NASA is definitely getting more into citizen science. So um, that's another way that you can get involved with all kinds of different projects. Um, and uh, yeah, when the sun gets active and there's more Aurora happening, we're all gonna have um, new cell phone cameras that can take those pictures and there's gonna be lots more photos. Um, and that's something I'm excited about because I'm not a great photographer, but um, they're not going to be as good as the photos that are in the film. So that's, uh, there's always going to be a place for those. So I want to just say thank you to all the people who have contributed um, to our project, taking photos for beauty and also for science and allowing us to uh, do, do both of those, do more with them. Um, so we really appreciate that. We archive the data, we protect the data, we publish scientifically with people and with those data. So um, we invite people to learn more and join us. Thank you. Wonderful. And that's a very, very powerful point there is that when people are contributing and taking photos and doing what they love and what they're interested in, uh, as you'll see when you see the film or if you've seen the film Chasing Steve, uh, that that collaboration uh, and speaking with NASA and discussing with you and the confirmations that came from that are actually quite relevant for for all science discovery. So um, that symbi that symbiotic relationship is really lovely. And thanks to Aurora Soros for continuing to grow that 
even more. I would like to invite Dr. Eric Donovan, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at University of Calgary in Alberta, um, to say hello and please tell us about your work uh, and your work with Steve and, and Citizen Science. Science. Thank you. Yeah, well, th thanks. Um, so so we, I'm a professor in physics, physics and astronomy. I'm a, I'm a, we call a space physicist at the University of Calgary. And we have a research group here that has focused on observations of night sky, not like, so, so I'm, I'm not an astronomer. I'm, again, what we call a space physicist. physicist. And we've been looking at, um, at the University of Calgary, things like we call air glow, um, uh, and and the aurora for, I mean, sixty years really as as an institution. And I I only came here twenty five years ago. And by now we've built up what I would say is I would unquestionably the world's foremost ground based observing system for looking at the aurora. And this goes from the you know the coast of the east coast of Canada all the way over to into Alaska, and from down near the US border all the way up to Resolute Bay and the Canadian High Arctic. And we have um, approaching 50 imagers um, that we have spread across the country that do different kinds of imaging. And, and the, the, the really fascinating thing that, that, that happened in this whole Steve story was this connection between citizen science, citizen scientists. And, and I like, like, I mean, I wanna be clear that the people who have come across in the Alberta Aurora Chasers are really some of the most fabulously talented night sky photographers I've ever I've ever seen, right? You know, and and so and so we have these fabulous kind of magazine quality images that have scientific content, and but then we have these scientific instruments which allow us to then take if we can take one of those citizen science images and put them within the context of our scientific images which aren't nowhere near as beautiful but they they have a they provide a different um window into this and then once we figured out how to do that then we could start using satellite observations of the processes that are causing this and so this story unfolded very fast it started with you know for, for me with liz's visit from nasa to calgary and then a, a, a bar session with chris ratzlaff and others um and and has led to some really fascinating science and a really different way that I look at, at kind of how I gather information for what we do. And, and, and so it, it's, it's, I mean, it's really fascinating actually. Thank you. Well, let's, let's hear then from the man on the front lines and the leader of the <laughs> Alberta Aurora Chasers himself, Chris Ratzlaff, uh, but, and he's the founder of the Alberta Aurora Chasers. Hi, Chris. Hello, uh, one of the founders. There's, there's a couple others involved as well. Um, thank you so much for, for setting this up and for bringing us all together. Um, I want to give a huge shout, shout out to the, to the entire Alberta Aurora Chasers community. There's 26,000 of us now that are, uh, have been participating in, contributing to all of the observations that we've, been, that we've been catching and sharing with Eric, with, NASA, with, uh, with Liz, and with uh, with Leah and Jess, it's really been really been ex extremely ex exciting. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to all the other Aurora communities that have been participating and communicating uh, about chasing Steve, about the film, as well as about the Q and A. So uh, the Southern Alberta, the Southern Hemisphere Aurora Group uh, from uh, New Zealand and Australia, they've been helping out a lot. Uh, the Saskatchewan Aurora Hunters, they've been also participating in this. Uh, Great Lake Aurora Hunters group, um, the, the group from Finland who I'm going to massacre their name, Revon Tuki, I'm not even trying. They've been doing an awesome job. They, they helped um, do a, a similar activity with the, uh, with the Dunes Aurora and helped discover uh, the Dunes Aurora that has been taking over some of the headlines lately. Um, as well as the Aurora Australis Tasmania group and the Aurora Hunters in Victoria. They've all been uh, helping share this Q and A, helping share the the Chasing Steve film. So it's been really a worldwide effort that has come out in the last couple of days uh, to promote the film. It's really been quite exciting. Um, and then just being able to participate with Eric and with Liz in bringing this this phenomenon to light um, has really been an uh, an eye opening and and uh, heartwarming. 
uh, endeavor. Um, when we first met with both Liz and Eric at the University of Calgary years ago now, uh, like that was like 2016, um, four years ago, it's crazy. Um, and, and when we flooded into that, into that small little classroom and kind of dominated, dominated the class, um, I, th I think Eric, we doubled the normal turnout that you tend to get at that, uh, at that event. That was, that was pretty wild, tripled. All right, even better. Um, that was, uh, that was exciting. I, I think, can I share this? No. I was going to try to share a screenshot, but I can't. Um, yeah, no, it's really been, it's really been exciting. Um, and for Jess and Lee, the, uh, the film, I keep on telling everybody, everybody that I've ever shared this with, it's really tells a beautiful tale about the Aurora chasing community, not just the Alberta Aurora chasers, but every other community that, that we've seen and shared it with. When I presented at the, uh, at the Aurora summit in, in the fall, um, you could see everybody that was in the film, they all had their counterparts in those communities. Everyone was sort of, everyone was represented in those communities. And, and you could see people nodding their heads at parts of the movie, at parts of the film. You could see uh, the, there were emotional responses when there was like a shared, a shared emotion. So you really, you guys have brought out a great, a great story that tells, I think, a story for people around the world. Well done. Thank you so much, Chris. And that's, you know, to that point, we've really seen how uh, the word has traveled so quickly and spread so quickly through all these groups with such excitement and enthusiasm. Um, what is it about Aurora that, that draw such human interest and awe and excitement and, and bring out that adventurous spirit in us to discover more? Uh, I'm going to ask all of you. So, Dr. Eric Donovan. Um, so for, you know, I think it means different things to different people, you know, obviously, but I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's truly, you know, it, it's, it's one of the most emotionally evocative natural phenomena, right? Because it, you know, when you, when you sort of really see a, a fabulous Aurora display, it, it's, it's, you know, if, if you're, if you're lucky, you're in a quiet place, you know, when you're out in nature and then you see this, this, this um, very, it's, it's, I mean, often very dynamic, often not so dynamic, but very beautiful. And, and, and kind of thinking about for me, you know, it was the first time I, I really saw it was I saw a display over Lake Huron, um, looking north over Lake Huron in, in Southern Ontario, Southwestern Ontario. And, and it was, it was really quiet and you see this, this aurora come up over the horizon and then it just sort of danced around for maybe 45 minutes and then receded back north and and you know i, I remember because i was a second year physics student at the time uh, undergraduate physics student and i remember thinking like like i didn't have the words for it at the time but since then i've started to think about this as truly our cosmic shore right so what you're watching is the interface between the earth and space right and this is where where stuff from the sun and stuff from, you know, I mean, this is this is really like like you know people talk about this thin layer of our atmosphere, and it's not that thin, but you know the aurora is this is this manifestation of cosmic processes, but happening in our atmosphere, you know, and that's and that's so for me it's it's kind of the evocative beauty of it, and then also also what it represents. You know, and you know, and, and it's and it's it's, um, you know, and then it's kind of a kind of a common thing too. Like it's not common, but it, it's a it's a point of commonality between people all over the world in northern and, and southern um, um, latitudes. And so, it, you know, and one of the things that I've always been kind of amazed at is the descriptions of the aurora. People talk about whether the, the aurora has sound, you know, and and you know, physicists will tell you it can't, but the legions of, of, of people who tell the same story of hearing it in all these different cultures um, who cannot have shared those stories, you know, um, means that there's, there's, there's so much about this that we don't understand as well. And, and so it, that's all of that, I think, is, is kind of the thing. And, and it's, it's, anyway, I'll stop and let other people know. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful, beautiful description and the cosmic shore. Uh, 
even just describing uh, describing the aurora without being there is certainly evocative. And um, Dr. McDonald, I would love to hear from you um, your response to that question, and as well a little bit about that um, that glitter bomb atmospheric mm -hmm. process. I love the word glitter bomb that we can use that in the context of speaking about Steve and Aurora. But um, what what for you? Dr. McDonald and Laura at Aurora Source um, made this something so evocative that you could dedicate your 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 life and your your work to this. Oh, you're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> <laughs> Caught myself. Okay, Eric uh, spoke so well about so many aspects yeah. of it. So I just, for me, um, the Aurora is actually how I got interested in physics. I wasn't interested in physics in college at all, and. I somehow got matched with a mentor who studied the Aurora and I started hearing about it. And it sounded like this complex, beautiful, natural phenomena. Um, and I got kind of hooked on that. So um, it's never the same and there's so much to explain still. Um, and going back to like the glitter bomb, like I could talk about plasma physics and bore you all day, but it's, it's the invisible made visible. So it's, you know, so much of what we study and we actually do study all kinds of aspects of the space environment. Um, but you can actually see them when, when they're causing, when it's causing the aurora, you can see the end result of like this really complex chain reaction that starts on the sun. And so as a scientist, there's just so much to understand there. But also, it's so beautiful to go out and see. And um, that's, and connect with with it emotionally as well. So it's the magic. It is. It is aurora and rainbows and all those things. Like you say, the end result of a, an incredible process. Um, Laura, you are dedicating your time and your work with Aurora Source as well. What did the aurora mean to you? Oh well. It is a beautiful phenomenon, but I think that for me, what excites me the most is the way that people all over the world are so interested in it and that it has such a, a wonderful mystery to it and such a long history of cross-cultural um, traditions about it. Um, and I love that people with citizen science are really coming together to learn more about it as well. Thank you. Okay, so Chris, frontline man again. I've seen, because I've been on this group of yours, uh, an incredible connection of people um, posting late at night. I heard that the weather's doing a certain thing. Grab your cameras, get in the truck, let's go. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how you are connected when you decide to go out and chase Aurora, how you stay so um, uh, in communication with each other and what, what this incredible um, web of community is like just on a day to day. I'm, I'm always surprised I see something and suddenly everyone's uh, getting geared up to go out. So I'd love to hear about that. Um, and Chris, you're on mute. There, there we, we go. go. Off. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that's what's really neat about the Aurora. You, Liz and Eric have talked about the, the beauty of it, the, the, the magic and the glitter bomb. Um, but the community that, that, that builds around sharing the knowledge of Aurora, when you can see Aurora, that's really amazing. And, and it's really something that, that has come together with the, the world of social media that we have available to us now, where we can, we can share in real time what we're seeing from around the planet, from around uh, specifically our area of the planet. And we can, uh, we, we can, help others know when to go out, know when to know, know where to look, know what to look for, and, and share a lot of our knowledge about photography um, and help others understand, you know, how to set up their camera, what to do, where to point your camera. Uh, it's just really been a great way to build a really great community. Um, and all, you know, everyone, everyone in the Aurora Chasers community will tell you that the Alberta Aurora Chasers community, and as well as I'm sure many of the other ones as well, are really some of the some of the best places in Facebook. It, a lot of the social media can get pretty toxic. Um, these communities are 
places where people are willing to help and share and reach out. So it's really been quite amazing. Could could I can I interject one thing here? Yeah. Um, well, I'm asking the moderator. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, because uh, I, I, I wanted to, I, I was thinking while Chris was talking that, that one thing about citizen science, I mean, citizen science takes many forms, obviously, I, I know probably less about citizen science than anybody else on the screen, you know, here right now. But one thing um, I'll say is that, you know, I, I played around with Zooniverse, um, you know, uh, a while ago, and then we had a project for people classifying aurora forms in, in our data. And and my initial impression of citizen science was people doing large amounts of kind of almost mundane tasks, right? You know, and you know, simple tasks that they would come and do this to help scientists accomplish something. And the the revolution that I experienced in this was that the level of expertise that the, the photographers that we work with now bring to the table means that they are they are experts on a par with the kind of expertise that we bring our expertise is very different right but they're actually doing something that it's not it's not like you know you know it's not like you know Siv or song or whomever or john anderson it's not like they go out and do something that i could do easily but i don't have time for they go out and do something that it would take me years to learn how to do Right. And that's, I think, a, a, it's been a really important education for me in all of this. Hmm. That's that's a, that's a really important point. Thanks for bringing that up. And Dr. McDonald, um, what are your thoughts about this, too, with the Aurorasaurus project and when people are contributing their information? Um, what does it feel like to be receiving new uh, and, and varied information through Aurorasaurus? Uh, it's, it's very exciting and it's, it's totally different from the other type of like traditional science that I've done with auroras, which, um, was involved with, um, studying auroras from rockets and satellites. So there you're collecting invisible glitter, um, and you are not connecting with people who are excited and, you know, asking questions. It's just, it's, it's so exciting to be involved in citizen science and so inspiring. Um, I also wanted to um, kind of pivot off what Eric just said about the expertise of the photographers and also answer one of the questions that was in the chat, which is whether there are um, people in the film who are both scientists and photographers. And I think there's, there's a very little, um, there's some overlap but like Eric just said, it's it's not quite the same, and there's really a unique expertise that's um, a really really neat. And like people are people are so smart, and they are observing, and they're um, asking questions, and that's uh, contributing to our field in ways that we really need to um, hear. And so citizen science has been um, a bridge to, to doing that. And I'm really grateful that I've been able to be a part of that. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Dr. McDonald and Don Evan. Um, and you know, I suppose with the filmmakers too, creating a film that looks at all of this and the Aurora Chasers and your specific work in science, um, is its own form of citizen science. So Leah and Jess, thank you for, for doing that and shining a light on this subject and being able to share it with people to sort of wake up that interest as well and encourage people to, to want to you know, embrace their own sense of discovery. So, so Chris Ratzlaff, given what these incredible scientists have just said, what's it like on the other side of that, being a citizen scientist, a photographer out there, and then finding out um, the actual science behind what you've captured? There's obviously been some incredible discovery. That's how Steve came about. Uh, what is that like when you share your, your information, your photos um, with scientific organizations and faculties, and then hear, wow, um, this is actually quite significant. What's that like for you all? It's really cool, right? Like it, to, to know that, that 
a passion that you have that you share with a whole bunch of people um, to know that that passion can contribute to to new science to to a new understanding about about a phenomena that we've all been watching for millennia um, that's really really neat uh, and and you know it's it's neat to be able to, to to be able to do it yourself but it's also really cool to be able to have to to watch other people making that same contribution. Um, all the people in the film, everyone that, that contributed to, to the, not just the first paper, but all of the continuing papers, there's so many different, there's so much different research going on. And there's people within our community, within other communities that are all contributing to that science. Um, to see all those, all those people being elevated to citizen scientists, to, to making contributions that have some real impact that have some real new understanding that's that's very neat it's very exciting so exciting um and you know I, I would love to get so into steve and um all the details around that discovery but that's what the film is about as well and the unfolding of that of of that discovery that confirmation and then it hitting the news headlines uh, around the world it, it was just totally awesome uh, for those of you who've watched Chasing Steve, you'll know about this. And for those of you who are yet to watch it, we hope that this conversation uh, makes you want to watch it and hear about the actual process of discovery and confirmation that occurred and where naming Steve came from. Um, and, and speaking of, actually, we have a question from the audience that relates to that point. Okay. Um, someone wants to know what makes Steve different than normal Aurora? So maybe, um, <laughs> um, Alexandra, I'll let you toss that question to our panelists. Okay, so let's let's chat about Steve. And then looking at our time here, we do have uh, a lot of questions coming in and Caroline can field those as well. So, um, you know what, let's start, uh, Liz, Dr. Liz McDonald, what makes Steve different and unique? Yeah, so, so lots of different reasons. Steve occurs farther away from the pole than the usual aurora. So for instance, in Alberta, you might be seeing the aurora more to the northern horizon, and Steve is straight overhead. Um, and so that's the location is unusual. Um, in subsequent research, we found out that the height is higher than the usual aurora. Um, and the, the way that it occurs is very different. So usual aurora is like a raining down of particles from space that impact the upper atmosphere and light it up. Um, however, Steve is actually what our, our, our paper and research has revealed is that, and, and the observations from satellites um, coupled with observations from the ground, what that has revealed is that Steve is this east to west flow of charged particles, and that's creating light. And so the fact that it's horizontal like that is very, very not like a usual aurora. Um, it doesn't happen without aurora, but um, those are a few of the ways that it's, it's different. Thank you. Dr. Donovan, how long do you think that Steve has been around? Is Steve newer than what we consider to be no. the usual Aurora? Or is Steve just uh, an equal brother on the sidelines? Well, I mean, Steve, Steve is, a, is, a, is a lesson in how scientists think, right? Um, so in 2000, and I believe it was 2012, I was looking at our real-time data and I saw that the aurora had gone south of, of, of I could see the, the equator part of the aurora was south of Edmonton. And so I thought, I, I, went, I went outside, I was in Brentwood in Calgary, I went outside and, and I was in a, in a neighborhood, it's lit up and I could see this beautiful, what I thought, I, I thought was an auroral arc overhead. And I took a photograph of it and I posted it on Facebook and made a comment about, about auroral tourism in Calgary, right, you know? And, and I thought it was an auroral arc. And in fact, I'd seen, I'd seen Steve myself in my data five or six times at least, and once in person and photographed it. And each time I saw it, I put it into a category of, of something that it wasn't. Like I, I thought, well, this, this is an auroral arc and it's not an auroral arc. And this is, 
This is, you know, I remember thinking it was an onset arc and thinking other things and, you know, and, and just, just kind of putting it into something where I knew there was a category. And then it was only the conversation with a guy named Neil Zeller at, 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 um, at a bar in Calgary where this professional level photographer who knew where he was, what he was looking at, and he told it to me in a certain way and showed it to me where I knew this was different than anything we, that we'd seen before, right? You know, and so, and so I think, you know, we tend to, as scientists, put things in categories that we know already exist, right? And, and um, but Steve's been around forever, <laughs> right? And Steve's been photographed for, for decades and observed for centuries, and it's not new at all. I love the, that. The new, the new part was it came to the attention of the scientific community. And it's really important because things need labels and they need to be put in a category. Um, but it's also so refreshing when it's the perception shifts and you realize, oh, this is something that is deserved of its own category and is of its own um, uniqueness. So, so Chris, Ratzlaff, when did you know that this was something different and was it only through confirmation of the other scientists or did you did you all have a hunch you know this is this is really something i think different here i mean honestly the point where i knew that it was something different was when i saw neil and eric arguing from across the pub <laughs> <laughs> that was it, it was it was it was a fun argument <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was a, it was a, a, a cool little debate um i think that's that, that's when it really, really started to kick in. Um, I mean, it was, it was earlier than that though, when we were, we were looking at this thing, we were calling it a proton arc. Um, we had reached out, I mean, people had been photographing it for years. Um, other communities had started calling it a proton arc, a proton aurora. Um, and, uh, and with Liz in the fall, before, in like October or November, before, before we all met in Calgary, um, we had started talking, we had, we had started um, conversations with uh, Jason Arns out of, uh, out of Alaska, uh, who was pointing out that it wasn't a proton aurora, that proton aurora does this. Um, but we hadn't really, it was really at that, that point in Calgary where, where the conversation really started and it really started to get exciting. Um, and you started to see Liz and Eric get, get excited about, about this thing that, that no one really understood what it was quite yet. Um, that was really, that was really sort of the, the tipping point, I think, for us. That was when, when the whole thing started to go a little bit, uh, started to have hints of going crazy. And, yeah. and then it was, yeah. And it certainly did, uh, it certainly did go crazy. Um, Leah and Jess, the filmmakers of Chasing Steve, to your point, you were looking for a, a phenomenal pun intended, uh, Canadian story. And, um, and you had heard about this and it, you heard about it and you thought, hmm, there's a, there's a great film right there. How did you hear about it? Where, where did you see the story at first? Uh, well, Jess actually first discovered, it was an article in the Globe and Mail or the Guardian actually. The Guardian. The Guardian. Oh. So, so it was like already an international story. It had been um, you know, talked about in the press widely. And I think the, you know, I think the story that is really unique and what attracted us to it is that, you know, as Eric and Liz are talking about, you know, the scientists who have their instruments and their particular ways of looking at something, we're not seeing something that, you know, people who are passionate about photography were capturing. And even though they didn't particularly know what it was, it was just this cool sort of, you know, and it was, Partly because of Aurora Saurus, Liz had reached out to the community. They were providing um, imagery to Aurora Saurus and data, um, and and just just that sort of turn of events that connected them to her, and that she came to Calgary, and so many of the Aurora Chasers in Alberta, Aurora Chasers came to to meet her and hear her lecture, um, and then they happened to be at this bar and happened to be show, showing these photographs. It's just it's a fun story. And then the, I think the fact too that it's called Steve is just, it's, I think it draws people in who are from outside of the science and outside of the scientific community. It feels accessible. It feels like something we can learn about. And of course, you know, the, the photographs are just so beautiful. I just, 
I'll quickly share my screen so we can do a shout out to all of the people in the, the film. Yes. Uh, because the um, the photos are just so beautiful. So that's that's just sort of a collection of some of the photos of the people that we that we featured in the film. And of course, there's so if you join Alberta Aurora Chaser's Facebook group, there's just so many incredible talented uh, photographers um, sharing their photos. So. Um, so, yeah. I up on your Instagram page too, um, Chasing Steve film on Instagram uh, with a number of those beautiful and photos. And I'll do a shout out, the, the one behind me right now, this is actually Steve and this was by June Wang, who was one of the photographers. And we actually, it's a it's a collection of photos. So he, he's, he's brought uh, his photos together to give you the expanse of Steve. And we, we actually used this image for our poster because we thought it was just so iconic and so beautiful. Um, but it's just one of so many beautiful uh, photos that we we had access to through this great group of of Aurora Chasers. Oh it's my gosh! Worth adding that photo is basically a once in a lifetime photo. That location, you have to book your flight, your like a helicopter out to that location months in advance, or you take a three day hike out to that location. So to be able to be in that spot that he was in. Uh, with the mountain right behind you and Steve arcing over top of it. It's a once in a lifetime photo. So you can get a sense of the dedication that the Alberta <laughs> Aurora chasers have to True. capturing their, their Aurora. Related to that, um, another question came in from the audience. They asked, why do you think Alberta residents were in a unique position to study and capture Steve? Could you speak to the location of the arc? Okay, Chris? I can take that a little bit, yeah. Um, Calgary sits, Calgary, well, the southern half of Alberta sits in a really great location uh, l from a latitude uh, perspective in order to be able to see, to see where Steve likes to hang out. Uh, when, when the aurora is, is uh, strong, uh, Steve likes to hang out over that sort of southern Canadian boundary line, um, kind of spanning well, all of the Canadian cities, really, all of the major Canadian cities kind of get covered by where Steve may show up. So it's really, we're really kind of sitting in a unique spot um, relative, especially to where rural researchers tended to look, you know, Alaska and, and much further location, much further north from, from where we are. So we're kind of in this unique location. And then you add in the fact that we've got these, um, social media spawned Aurora communities that have been popping up around these large population centers like Calgary, like Edmonton, like Regina and Saskatoon. Uh, so we've got a lot of people that are out there looking at the Aurora, watching it, um, and really in this sort of ideal spot to catch Steve. Um, and you couple that with the, with the camera technology that's been popping up over the last 10 years, just getting better and better and better and putting really great equipment in the hands of of amateur photographers and you got this recipe for coming across something that uh, that that hadn't really coming across and documenting something that hadn't really been been documented well before it's so great and um we want to actually hear more questions from the audience but i have a quick one for you chris um in terms of a beginner's guide to getting out there and chasing Aurora and chasing Steve, maybe capturing him for a moment if we're lucky, do you have a, a website or a link or a resource or a book where anyone watching this who now wants to grab a camera and go find Steve um, could do? Uh, was just maybe a, a checklist or is that something that we could share down the road with the community? Well, one of, one of the quickest ways is really just to head to the Alberta Aurora Chasers community. Um, we, uh, uh, especially for Canadians, but um, we, the, the community itself is a really great resource for anyone who asks, uh, asks a question. Dozens of people will jump in and be willing to answer that question um, almost immediately. So it, it's, it's really a great resource. We've got, a, we've got a pinned post at the top of our page as well that provides some, some entry level, um, some entry guides into the community, into some photography tips, into some forecasting tips. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of resources within our community that'll help. Um, if you're elsewhere, if you're somewhere other than, than Alberta or Canada, there are lots of really great Aurora communities um, available in your area. Uh, 
generally in the northern or southern parts of your of your hemisphere, there probably aren't very many good Los Angeles Aurora communities. But um, definitely, if you're in a if you're in a northern or southern hemisphere location, um, check out for your for your local Aurora community. I'm sure they'll be willing to help you out as well. Thanks so much for that. And a reminder, that is a Facebook group, uh, primarily Alberta Aurora Chasers. Uh, but and a lot of the communities are. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. Them. It's been wonderful. And we've seen actually just, just sharing the trailer to Chasing Steve um, by the next day, almost five, six, 7,000 people had watched it. Um, so thanks for your help in, in, in that and all the Alberta Aurora Chasers. Caroline, do you want to uh, field some audience participation Q and A's and thanks to everyone who's who's watching and tuning in. This is really amazing and special to have you here. Yeah, and speaking of Aurora groups, Daniel from the Southern Hemisphere Aurora group is asking, um, has there been any conclusion as to why Steve has only been seen to flow westward and whether there has been any link found between Steve and pickets? Who wants to jump in on that? Um, I'll take the the so part of that question and then Eric can add on maybe but um, yeah so I would say that the westward flow in both the northern and southern hemisphere um, the aurora is to first order symmetric and driven by processes happening a long 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 way away in space like hundreds of thousands of miles and we don't fully know when a Steve is going to happen with aurora um, that's why you can't really book um, something for going out and spotting it yet. Um, and also why we need lots of people to continue to report when they see it. But, um, but basically the westward um, flow is as a result of like the Aurora being this cosmic shore processes happening way out in um, what we call the magneto tail. And, um, and Steve being an unusual occurrence, an un unusual um, uh, result of that. So there's kind of like, there's a flow and there's sort of like kink in the flow and um, it sets up with this westward direction, this very narrow channel um, at these lower latitude regions. There's often a, a westward flow, um, but it's, it's the result of both processes happening way out in space, driving the aurora from even further out in space towards the Earth, um, as well as um, the effects in the upper atmosphere. So that, um, I wish I had a better visualization on that to offer you right now, but uh, that's sort of a um, hand wavy explanation of that, but, um, but yeah. Is that something that could be found at Aurorasaurus? Um, we have a nice little like GIF that shows, I mean, it doesn't show the, it shows the westward flow, but it doesn't show the whole process happening in the magnetosphere. Um, there's, uh, that, that's a bigger challenge of like visualizing all of that that happens um, that, uh, that we are still working on. So, especially in translating it so that it's, you know, it might be in papers, but then, you know, a lot of magnetospheric physics is not very well explained. Um, so there's a lot of pieces of that that we're working on. Thank you. Um, Dr. Donovan. You I mean, I'll add, I mean, the, 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 the westward motion is, it's, it's, Liz is struggling to describe it because it's a real struggle. It's a very difficult thing to describe it. I can't add anything to it. Like it's, 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 um, yeah, it's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very tough, it's a, it's a tough thing to, to, to even kind of understand for me, let alone try, try to explain the, the pickets and, 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 and the, the mauve thing, mauveish colored thing that, that that's what I call Steve. And so I always call it Steve and the picket fence, right? And they're very clearly caused by the same thing, right? Um, like meaning, meaning there's, there's a region where there's something very interesting going on and, you know, and, and often you see these pickets which are very dramatic and very beautiful. And, and those pickets are what I would call classically Aurora because they are caused by precipitating particles, right? And, and the Steve thing, Liz and I have a disagreement there, doesn't matter, but I, I don't think of it as Aurora because I, 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 
I don't think it's caused, you know, I, I think it's caused differently, but that's, that's not the point. The point is that um, a lot of people are trying to explore this connection between the two of them. And, and we don't even know, for instance, because in order to, to kind of, you have, you have to kind of look up from below one of these features to really sort out kind of the spatial relationship between them. And Steve is rare enough that we don't have much observations that are close enough to what we would call zenith to, to sort out whether the pickets are beside Steve or under Steve. The pickets could be caused by a precipitation that's coming from far above, as Liz says, far out in space. And there's also the possibility that pickets could be caused by some connection between the Steve thing, which is a bit higher in altitude, and the green pickets, which are lower in altitude. And you could be looking at some very weird aurora that's caused by just a few hundred kilometers above the top of the, above the, 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 ion, the, the bottom of the ionosphere. And the final thing I'll say is that the weird thing is that the green pickets are like when you look at an aurora, normally that you can take a spectra of the aurora of the light and the spectra will have spectral lines in it, right? And for, for aurora, it will have spectral lines in it and it will have many spectral lines in it. And the pickets are green. They are one spectral line of green. They are the purest color <laughs> coming out of the night sky. And that's extremely weird. Um, very, very, very difficult to kind of envision how that happens. And it's got a lot of people thinking. Well, as Chris said, one of the reasons when he knew this was something and it was exciting when there was a difference of opinion coming from the bar and there was some, some argument and, and different views on something. And that's how when you see two scientists doing that. That's how, you know, it's, it's something. Uh, I also think it's, it, it's quite remarkable that um, each of you have expressed uh, a lack of terminology for certain parts of that. And um, uh, perhaps that's again, what makes this so, so awe striking is that some things until there's science, scientific explanation, it has to be left to the poets and the dreamers. Um, <laughs> Caroline, more questions. Yeah, definitely. So this is more of a question for the filmmakers now. Um, uh, Vincent wants to know how many of the photographers you interviewed were scientists as well. You take it, Jess. <laughs> oh, I might need some help here. Um, <laughs> maybe Chris might want to jump on uh, as well. I I believe we. I mean, John Anderson uh, is a geologist, and I think everybody else are artists, photographers. We had programmers, but uh, uh, we had computer people, but uh, um, we had ranchers, but I'm not, I'm, I don't actually think they're, it, it, for those that were featured in the film, we're, we're scientists. They are all scientists now though. They're citizens. Yeah, they're citizen <laughs> scientists. Did I, it, it, is that right, Chris? Oh, it's totally accurate. I think, okay, I mean, okay. that's, that's what's really great about these communities is that, that people are coming from all walks of life. Some are scientists, some are teachers, some are farmers. You know, they're, they're from every spectrum. It's really, it's really great. And you caught them all, so. <laughs> Fantastic. And then we have another question also from Vincent. Do you envision that we will discover more types of new auroras in the future? So who yes. wants to take a stab at that one? We hear a yes. Is that yes? From I, I mean, ab absolutely. I mean, like, like it's it's because we've like, I mean, you know, you you could talk, I could, I could talk for hours on this, and I'll talk for seconds on this. But but you know, we we use the aurora to study this region of space around the Earth called the magnetosphere, and we use the aurora to study how the magnetosphere affects our atmosphere, right? And that has driven us to. Kind of kind of coalesce around specific problems and so we tend to look at the substorm or look at the arc or whatever you know and then it, it has really been this steve story and then this dune story in finland and there's for sure more to come because 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 now people are looking and in fact chris and i have talked about having a conference like a, a small workshop where we might bring together 10 auroral scientists and maybe 10 um uh, 
Alberta Roar Chaser photographers and then just have them show us for three or four days what they have, right? And confront us with this stuff, right? Dr. McDonald, what do you think? Do we have more auroras in our future? Uh, definitely. And I would also add that, um, you know, as the technology gets better, we're literally able to kind of resolve more photons that are the result of these invisible processes happening a long way away. And so not only just um, new, new, but better resolved and deeper understanding. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that people have been seeing this for a long time and studying Aurora for a long time. And so um, in some cases, you know, things have been rediscovered or people have noticed things, especially in the past when um, people were more commonly outside, light pollution was less, um, people knew their constellations and, and um, you know, it's, but we're, things are all coming together now with um, the technologies that we have and the opportunities that we have to connect over great distances as well. Um, and the scientific capabilities to study Aurora, putting all of those together um, will be really powerful for uh, discovering discovery. That's fantastic. And um, I think we're near the close, so we're not going to take any more questions now. I just want to thank Alexandra for hosting, the filmmakers for creating this, all of you for your amazing work in this field. And I just want to open it up to final thoughts from everyone before we all go. And might I add, uh, if anyone wants to include in their final thoughts, um, maybe a call to action, something something that we can do uh, when we go outside and and look up at the sky uh, because we are in unprecedented times, but we are still encouraged to get some fresh air. So um, any thoughts to that end are appreciated as well. I'll, I'll, I'll say um, people often ask me what they need to do to see the Aurora. And I say, look up, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people haven't seen the Aurora because they don't look up, right? And so, and so that, that would be my call to action. And I wanna thank Jess and Leah. Um, uh, because I, I think it's a fabulous, I love the movie and it's, it's a kind of a really emotional film and I think you did a wonderful job with it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'll just say thank you to everybody. Um, we just felt very privileged to, to be able to tell the story. And um, as Jess had said earlier, you guys really opened up your, your, your chest of amazing photographs and your doors to us and let us put a camera in your face. But I hope that you know, as inspiring as it was for us, I hope we, the film continues to inspire. And, and I think the Aurora Soros project is so great. And just to be connected with that, and I would, I would, the call to action I would make with is to, is to join the Aurora Chasers, look at these beautiful photographs, but as Eric said too, try, try your hand at going out and looking up at the night sky. And on that note, there's a link in the chat, um, scistory.org forward slash Chasing Steve. For those of you who haven't seen the documentary yet, you can find the documentary there, as well as a link to find Aurora Soros and other citizen science resources. Mm -hmm. And just a quick shout out about the Chasing Steve film. Uh, it is available through the month, Citizen Science Month of April for 99 cents um, to celebrate that. Citizen Science Month. So thanks for doing that, Leah and Jess, to make it more accessible for everyone. And even parents who are homeschooling with um, perhaps older kids, but this this is kind of a cool one to, to sit down and watch as a family and learn a little bit. And on that note, I think we'll end it here. Um, we're right on the hour. So thank you again and um, keep looking up. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.